thanks so much to Marilyn for hosting us uh, out here uh, at our, our wonderful uh, Carver's Bay Library. Uh, and thanks to all y'all for coming out here, especially I know the weather's been a little iffy uh, mm -hmm. lately, so <laughs> we really appreciate you coming out and braving it. But uh, you're doing it for, for a good reason uh, with uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Ron Days here. And next week uh, we'll have, uh, I won't say better half, uh, Mr. Day's better half, but because it would probably equal half. Mm -hmm. uh, it's better. It a, it won't it's, a, he's going to agree with you, it's better. And, uh, <laughs> Natalie Day's will be here, and so we're thrilled uh, thrilled to, to have her as well. So uh, wonderful and very generous of them to, to be part of this. This is uh, a series called the DigiBridge 2.0 series, and we've got 12 uh, humanities presentations uh, all told. Uh, and so this is our fifth. Uh, we started out at, uh, at our Southern Georgetown Library on Powell Road in Georgetown uh, and did four presentations there. And then this will be the first of our of four presentations on Wednesdays at 2 p.m. Uh, here at, at our Carver's Bay Library on, on Choppy Road in Hemingway. And then we'll have four more uh, throughout the month of May all in Andrews at our Andrews Library. So um, please stay tuned for those. Uh, if you happen to miss a presentation, we're filming them and we'll put them up online uh, afterwards, uh, a few days after, on our Georgetown County Library YouTube page. So check them out there. Or you might want to review them as well. Um, the DigiBridge 2.0 series is supported with a growth grant from South Carolina Humanities with funding provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities. South Carolina Humanities is a not-for-profit organization inspiring, engaging, and enriching South Carolinians with programs on literature, history, culture, and heritage. And I think uh, our presenter today, uh, Mr. Rondes, uh, I think he, he does a little bit of all those things. He, he does it all, uh, literature, history, culture, and heritage. Um, a partial list of Ron Day's professional endeavors includes singer, songwriter, performing artist, author, cultural preservationist. Um, he was the former chairman of the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor, vice president of creative education at Brook Green Gardens, uh, just to name, to name a few of the roles and positions he's held. Um, so he, he's a major part of, of the community in Georgetown County here. Ron also starred along with his wife, Natalie, in the Nick Jr. award-winning TV series, Gullah Gullah Highland, for which they also served as cultural consultants. Uh, so we were more than honored and delighted to feature Ron Days for, for this library program today speaking to us about the living legacy of his native Gullah culture that has been uh, so much a part of our South Carolina uh, low country. So please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Mr. Ron Days. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Marilyn reminded me upon my arrival that I was here at the Carlsberg Branch Library uh, I don't know if it was when it was dedicated or soon after it had opened, which was soon after I had moved to Georgetown County and had begun working at Brooklyn Gardens. I then, I'm sure, I shared information or some stories about Gullah culture um, and heritage, and that's what we'll be doing today. This program is entitled Gullah Geechee Scrint. Now, Gullah Geechee is the, uh, or Scrint, is the Gullah Geechee expression for? Strength. Strength, absolutely right. One of the grammatical rules when speaking Gullah Geechee is that whenever uh, there's an S-T-R um, at the beginning of words, it's substituted with an S-K-R. So street would be pronounced as? Street. Street, absolutely <laughs> right. And um, the final consonants of words are just dropped off, not Scrinth, but scrinth. Absolutely right. Now, the words Gullah Geechee identify three things. Who knows what those three things are? Um, accent? 
an accent or a language. Language, yeah, yeah. Oh, you're close. Uh huh. <laughs> a language. Uh, Location. Culture. A culture, yes, <laughs> and a group of people. People. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> right. And Gullah Geechee yeah. communities extend right along the coast of the Atlantic Ocean in four states, all the way from Wilmington, North Carolina, down throughout South Carolina and Georgia, all the way down to St. Augustine, Florida. Oh. The Gullah Geechee Cultural Her Heritage Corridor is a national heritage area. It's among 50 others, but it is the only heritage area in this country that promotes the living culture of an African-American population. Now, uh, it encompasses 70 barrier islands in that four state area, and it is named for the group of people who were descendants of West Africans who were brought to this country during the 17 and 1800s to produce cash crops. Uh, it started with indigo, then in some communities it was cotton, but in the communities of Georgetown and Horry counties, which crop right. was king? Right. 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 Absolutely right. right. And those um, Gullah Geechee people are descendants of those Africans who were enslaved because of the skills and knowledge about rice production. They had been growing rice successfully for hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years. And it is because of the, those skills and the strength of those people mm -hmm. that rice, were, during the 17 and 1800s, half of this country's rice was produced right here. Uh, in areas of the Waccamaw Neck, particularly in those plantations of Plantersville, um, including the, now you see, when I came to Brook Green Gardens, and when I heard others talk about the community right here, they did not say choppy. How would it be pronounced? Choppy. 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 That's the way that I would heard it. Choppy. <laughs> because that would be the Gullah Geechee influence yes. on that language. Now, um, People whose roots are Gullah Geechee live not only in the southeastern coastal communities. They reside throughout the United States of America and throughout the world. When, wherever they are, however, at some point and at some time, something about our speech or beliefs identify us as unique among other African Americans. Something somehow reminds others of the speech and the cultures of communities of the African diaspora, and these include Jamaica, the West Indies, and even Brazil. Those are cousin cultures. Now, as a speechway, Gullah, or Geechee, or, or as it's known today, Gullah Geechee, for years was considered bad English, broken English, substandard English. Um, when I graduated from college, and I, I'm from St. Helena Island, South Carolina, in Beaufort County, I went to school at Hampton Institute, now Hampton uh, University in Hampton, Virginia. When I returned home, um, uh, because Gullah was considered bad English, broken English, substandard English, <laughs> an amazing thing had happened. Uh, some linguists had moved to the community and had begun a project of translating the Bible into Gullah. Wow. Now, the Bible is a pretty significant document, many of you would say. So there were many community members, why do you want to, why should it be spoken this way? Because we've been taught we should not speak this way. Um, but they said that Gullah was a language. Um, it had its own grammatical rules. Um, one of those I uh, mentioned earlier in the pronunciation of strength as skrent, because the S-T-R would be uh, substituted with an S-K-R. It had been argued that the way we did so was because of big lips, or thick tongues, or low intelligence. 
which was a way of throwing shade at our African heritage. But uh, Dr. Lorenzo Dow Turner, our country's first African-American linguist, during the 1920s began to refute this claim. His research documented that Gullah words and expressions have roots in numerous West African languages and dialects. Some of these words have become a part of everyday English or Southern speech. Now think of how that language began. There were Africans from numerous countries along the Rice Coast, the Gold Coast, and even the West Central African Coast who were put on slave ships. And they became introduced to other Africans that they didn't know the way that they, they spoke. There were all these different languages. There were even the languages of their captors, the Portuguese, the British, the French. If you had come into this room this day and you were the only one who spoke your language, everyone else spoke another language, wouldn't it be a bit confusing? <laughs> but think, over the two to three month journey across the Atlantic Ocean, and then for years when they were put on these plantations that were separated by the waterways, that language, um, they became uh, influenced by the language of their captors, and that substandard language, or that pidgin language, soon became the dominant language. And that's just what Gullah Geechee is. It combines all these languages, um, words and expressions from different languages, all in one. They come from, in Africa, they include the Wolof and Mandinka languages of Senegal and Gambia, the Mende and Bai languages of Sierra Leone and Liberia, the Malinke and Fawn languages of the Niger Congo or Sub-Saharan African countries, the Bambara language of Mali, wow. the Hausa language of Nigeria, Benin, Ghana, and Congo, the Igbo, Ibo, Ibibio, and Yoruba Bini languages of Nigeria, just to name a few. All of those languages, and there are some words and expressions uh, that have become part of everyday ling language. Uh, that one of them is hoodoo. Hoodoo sounds like voodoo, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. Hoodoo is the Hausa for bad luck. Hoodoo <laughs> is the Igbo language for you. Now, in Galagishi expression, would say, how on a do? I do good. How on a do? Uh -huh. And what does on a mean? Uh, you, absolutely right, from Unu, which is from the Igbo language. Now, there are different pronunciations up and down the Gullah Geechee cor Corridor. In Buford, we say Una. In Charleston or Chaston, you might hear Una. And sometimes in Conway, maybe even here, you may hear Yuna. Una, Una, or Yuna. It all means you as a singular plural or possessive pronoun. Now, Bakra. <laughs> Bakra is the Bibio language. Who's a Bakra? Who you ever heard that word yes, up here? Um, a Bakra is a? White man. A white man. It could be a white person. Yes. Male or female. Right, yeah. Bakra. Coming from the Bibio language. Nana or Nana is Tui for a grandmother yes. for an elderly woman. Now, perhaps you, are, have you heard Bobo before? No, you call someone Bobo? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah Bobo is Fante from the country of Ghana. Bobo is um, Fante for boy. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Now, and you might think, some white people may say that they do not speak Gullah, but if they have lived in, grew up in Gullah Geechee communities, mm -hmm. yes, they do. Yeah. And sometimes they may call their close friends, not Bobo, but they would say, Baba. Baba. Absolutely Baba. right. Baba. Baba. Bobo. Baba. All come from boy or a male child. <laughs> Tot is Kikongo for 
carry. <laughs> Most women know what tote means because yes, they have sir. tote yes. bags. Yes. Tote means to carry something yes, in your hands or your arms or sometimes on your head. You yes. see the Africans and people carrying, they are toting it, toting the baskets. Bibby is, is Congo for small chicken or a baby bird. Gooba, have you heard the word gooba before? Gooba is kabundu for peanut or groundnut. A gooba. And a kuda. What's a kuda? Turtle. Turtle! It comes from the Bamara language for turtle. Words from Africa that have become a part of everyday English and yam. Sweet potato. Eat. Yes. You sat out to the table and you yam them up. <laughs> You're familiar? Now, in addition to including words from numerous West African languages, Gullah Geechee also has its own grammatical rules, which are based on West African speech patterns. When words that begin with S-T-R are pronounced, the T is substituted with the K. Therefore, as we said earlier, street is pronounced as Stripe is pronounced as Stripe. And as we learned, strength is pronounced as scrunt. Another grammatical rule is used with words that begin with a TH. The TH is either substituted with a D, so that then is them, and them would be them. The H remains silent so that thief is. Teeth. 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 And thunder. thunder would be. Thunder. Oh, last night you had a thunder to roof. <laughs> and uh, when, uh, when Emery came in the room and saw the, the snacks on the back, he asked the woman, um, or she asked him, the he was going to steal it. Uh, uh, he would have teeth. That's right, you <laughs> cheat <laughs> The H is substituted with an S, or sometimes silent, so that three is pronounced as tree, or tree, and throw would be throw or tro. Absolutely right. So for the next 40 minutes or so, join me in singing, interacting, listening, and responding together to learn about the strength, that is, the strength of Gullah Geechee people. It's important to recognize that Gullah Geechee culture is contemporary. Although a portion of our heritage evolved on the plantations that produced cash crops, uh, the culture is not locked in time from some 300 years ago in the ways that people dress, mm -hmm. the way that people speak, the way that they create art, or in the jobs and occupations to which Gullah people inspire. Um, or aspire, I should say. Now, the art that you're seeing, uh, that's art created by my wife, who will be next week's speaker, oh Natalie Days. My better hat. Mm -hmm. right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> there are several cultural values that have sustained Gullah Geechee people throughout history and that either are or should be maintained by Gullah Geechee people today. Yes, those values are closely related to those of other cultures, but we'll examine how these values have been manifested in my culture. And we'll explore only three of these values today. They are respect for elders, spirituality, and tenacity. I am a Gullah Geechee. I'm a native of St. Helena Island, South Carolina, located in Beaufort County. Now, I didn't always identify myself by this term. Throughout my childhood into uh, young adulthood, we called ourselves Sea Islanders. And we, I was quite proud to be a Sea Islander. It was only years later that the word Gullah became synonymous with Sea Island. So whereas I can't say, I was never ashamed of being Gullah, I didn't identify myself as Gullah. Gullo at that time was only considered as a speech way, and I knew I did not speak Gullah mm -hmm. as many other people from Gullah Geechee communities. But I said that when I went to Hampton Institute, 
people heard something different in my speech. And they were always asking, well, you're not from this country, are you? Or maybe you were born here, but your parents weren't born here. Or your parents weren't, were born here, but you weren't born here. Now, all I can say was, I'm from an island, one of those coastal islands of South Carolina. Um, we found no embarrassment and pride in identifying ourselves as Sea Islanders. You see, those two words, Gullah and Geechee, used to bring shame to those who did not yet know the honor that is ours to proclaim. The differing number of heritages and cultures of America have made this country what it is today. What other heritages are among us in the room? Are we all Gullah Geechee? From Gullah Geechee communities? Irish. Irish. Wonderful. Wonderful. There are people who are born in Gullah Geechee communities, and we are known as? Geechee. Binyas. Because we have been here, or been here. <laughs> into a Gullah Geechee community relocating from any place else in the universe would never be called a Binya. What would they be called? A Kamya, because they have come here or come here. Now, value number one, respect for elders, would be expressed in Gullah Geechee as respect for elders. Because in the language, the final consonants remain silent. So not respect, but respect. E-R, A-R, and O-R word endings are substituted with an A-H sound. Therefore, not elders, but elders. elders. Respect your elders. Um, another grammatical rule allows for not voicing the first syllable of some words. With that rule in mind, some Gullah Geechee speakers then would state the value as spec for elders. Oh, yeah, yeah. The ancestors of Gullah Geechee people came primarily from countries of the West African rice coast. Now these include present day Senegal, Gambia, Guinea, Guinea-Bissau, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. Africans also were enslaved from non-rice producing countries like the Gold Coast countries, Nigeria, and Ghana, and Togo, and Benin. Have you seen the documentary High on the Hog? It was on Netflix recently, where they talked about visiting Benin, I believe. And if you watch it, there will be so many similarities with our culture in this community. Africans also were enslaved from other countries along the western coast, West Central Africa, and those include Cameroon, Gabon, Congo, and Angola. Angola sounds a lot like Gullah, and maybe that's how the, where the word originated. But most of the Africans who were brought to these communities came from the rice-producing countries. And in Sierra Leone and Liberia, there are tribal groups known as the Golas, sounds like Gullah, and the Gizi, it's spelled K-I-S-S-I, but pronounced Gizi, sounds a lot like Gizi, absolutely right. Now, those in Georgia um, were considered Gizis, particularly those living along the Ogichi River, which is a Native American, a word of Native American heritage. But on those rice plantations, or those plantations along the Ogichi River, there were these Africans who, because of their African heritage, ate a lot of rice. So it was that Gichi people eat a lot of rice. Now, respect for elders in West African villages was fulfilled through festivals, events, and rituals that fostered community development. Tenets and values passed along by the elders, including beliefs that one's kinfolks are worth more than money. The community must speak well of each individual. Individuals do not exist alone, and the community's good must be strived for. Would you say that's a value of the Chapi community? Oh, yeah. oh yes. Now, on rice plantations of the Carolinas and Georgia colonies during the 17 and 1800s, 
demonstrating spec for elders, mm -hmm. including remembering and secretly observing African beliefs and customs that plantation owners did not or wanted them to discontinue. Mm -hmm. Why so? Because their efforts of resistance were regarded as challenges to forced systemic attempts toward institutionalized subordination and dehumanization. The one significant cultural aspect that elders passed on to their Gullah Geechee descendants, I think you're ahead of me. Uh, it's a one face on post bright. One significant cultural aspect that elders passed down to their Gullah Geechee descendants has included giving them basket names or nicknames to newborns. Why? Because names have meaning and should not be selected arbitrarily. Basket names involves assigning a nickname that rec recognizes the essence of the individual and or distinguishes circumstances about the child's birth. In Yoruba, Twi, uh, um, Igbo, and Dahomean cultures, they assign names to children uh, that pertain to the day of the week that a child is born. In Ghana, for instance, a male child born on a Friday is named Coffee. <laughs> and I had an uncle born on Friday <laughs> whose name was Coffee. A Gullah Yiji basket name also can be given for an occurrence or a physical characteristic of the infant at the time of birth. Like the basket name Sweet Mouth could be given to a child born soon after the mother ate a cake oh. or some other sweet <laughs> confection. Now, respect for elders involves honoring the inherent value of older individuals regardless of their stations in life. On plantations, the iron workers, the brick masons, carpenters, and other skilled laborers were esteemed by the fellow um, enslaved people, despite the fact that all enslaved persons were regarded solely as personal property by plantation owners. Mm -hmm. Following West African heritage, it was believed that those who had been gifted with a special skill had been blessed by the ancestors. On the same hand, field workers were worthy of respect because of their physical abilities and their strength. Now, in the new, in the new world, skilled laborers, particularly elderly ones, were regarded in the same way as the griots or jalis, that is, the storytellers of West African villages had been. Unlike field hands, skilled laborers found themselves in the presence of Bakradem. So yeah. they found themselves in the presence of white, man. white people. Absolutely right. Throughout their work days and as they worked from plantation to plantation where they were sent, they were able to overhear or yeti conversations to which other enslaved workers were not privy and would then pass along important information and news such as sightings and of the well-being of family members who perhaps had been sold away to other plantation owners. Imagine the feeling of joy and relief to receive even the smallest tidbit of information about a family member who you did not ever know that you would see again in life. Now, I'm going to need two volunteers. In keeping with Gullah Geechee custom, give yourself a basket name or what you see or sense as the moment of new understanding that has been birthed in you. Or, if you know it, tell the meaning of your name. What do you think your basket name would be? <laughs> well, I was not given a basket name. Um, but I believe if I had been given a basket name, it would be Huda. You see, I'm the last of nine children. And all the others, except the brother ahead of me and myself, had been born at home. My, the brother just ahead of me, just about 30 months. He, he had been born in the hospital. When he, 
when my parents found out they were expected, all the others, I told them, they, they put up a fuss. <laughs> what are they doing? How are we going to eat now? Um, so that after my brother's birth, my um, mother meant to have her tubes tied. But before the day of that appointment, I was on the way. <laughs> and because of the weight that she carried, she, nor my father, said a word about it to any one of them. So that they only knew about my arrival when I was brought home from the Ooh. hospital. And I'm sure what they said was, who that? That would have been my basket name. Now, give yourself a basket name. <laughs> what is your, do you know the meaning of the name that you have? My name, my name is, uh, well, it's Fedoria, but people call me Fedora, mm -hmm. and that means hat. That means hat? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Anyone else? Anyone else? <laughs> Just one more. <laughs> Yes! I feel like my basket name would have been Torn for Storm. All right. There was a very large storm when I was born. A very large storm. Thank you so much. Now, a West African proverb states, when an elder dies, it is as if a whole library has burned. So I'm going to await a response to the upcoming questions. So please get ready. What library in your family or community has burned. That is, what elder has died, and what information do you wish you had researched, asked, or documented before his or her transition, and why? Before moving to our next value of Gullah Geechee's script, join me in singing spirit music that emphasizes the importance of respecting elders. The song is The Old Sheep Don't Know the Road, and we got choir members in the house, and, and we are, and many of us of Gullah Geechee heritage, we know that there are call and response. The leader calls out the words, and everyone sings back, or responds, answers. The Old Sheep Don't Know the Road, and the response lines are in italics. And yes, I will be listening. I'm a Yeti. <laughs> Join with me. The old sheep don't know the road. The old sheep don't know the road. The old sheep don't know the road. The young lamb must find a way. The young lamb must find a way. The old sheep don't know the road. The old sheep don't know. Know the young lamb must find a way, cause you reap just the way you sow. The young lamb must find a way. The old sheep done know the road. The old sheep done know the road. The old sheep done know the road. The young lamb must find a way. The young lamb must find a way. If you lie, you steal, and then the young lamb must find a way. You cheat, then kill in the end. The young lamb must find a way. by elders in my community. They would say, if you lie, you steal. If you steal, you cheat. And if you cheat, you kill. <laughs> now, was that a similar chant that you heard oh. in this community? Yeah. It meant, speak truthfully <laughs> always. Now, who wishes to answer the questions, po questions posed earlier? What library in your family or community has burned? That is, what elder has died, and what information do you wish you had researched, asked, or 
documented before his or her transition and why. One or two people. My <laughs> grandmother, Charlotte Canteen Wentz. I wish I had gotten all her recipe for the cornbread, the biscuit, <laughs> the, the potato porn, mm -hmm. the sweet potato pie, and all that good stuff. Richard's heritage. Yes, because I, yeah, I used to call right. her and ask her. You would have had a locker. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Who else? My grandma Beulah. Yes, why so? So I can learn how to cook. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Value number two is spirituality. Now for clearer understanding and listening, listen, Galagiji's spirituality is like labyrinthine waterways that meander in marshes and branches throughout the Galagiji cultural heritage corridor. It ebbs and flows with significance from generation to generation. With roots in West African religious practices and in Christianity, it includes numerous practices, practices that connect mortals with the spirit world and bears witness that the spirit of God lives in everything. One spiritual practice at times assigns meaning to physical conditions. My mother was born with a call. Who knows what a call is? C-A-U-L. That was a filmy membrane oh. covering her head. And because of this condition at birth, she was thought to have special powers. The sick were brought to her to be touched or even breathed on because it was said that healing powers flowed through her veins. Wow. Now, throughout life, she confided that she could understand the thoughts of others even when they didn't express those thoughts verbally. Another practice of it is funerary practices. It includes having younger children, younger than age three, pass over the casket, over the casket yeah. back and forth mm -hmm. with the deceased person in the casket. Mm -hmm. And this action is believed to ensure that the deceased person's spirit does mm -hmm. not come back to lure that young child to join the spirit world. Also a deceased person's personal effects. If a person died and was a cook, their mixing bowl might be placed on the grave. If they smoked, if they smoked a pipe, the pipe might be on the grave. If an individual fished, their fishing pole might be put atop the grave because it was believed that the deceased person's spirit would not stay in the grave, but would come out and would feel at home among his or her belongings. Yet another practice, shouting, is a religious holy dance, and it's not a vocal response. It involves singing while moving counterclockwise in a circle. And as the tempo of the song quickens, The friends of hand clapping and foot stomping. Persons who shout move their feet slightly from side to side. They will never cross them. That was considered worldly dancing. And the end result was possession by a spirit that brings peace, rest, hope, joy, enlightenment, perseverance, and understanding. Now, in the Galagiji community, it's understood that the spirit, that is the energy within a person or a thing, can be felt and should not be ignored. Now, here is a Gala proverb. At, go back. After it's read, please raise your hand if you wish to share your interpretation of its meaning. If your spirit don't agree, trust the Lord. It ain't hard to see. What does that proverb mean? Read it again. You can't read them. <laughs> if your spirit don't agree, trust the Lord. Oh. And make fun of the seat. If your spirit don't agree, trust the Lord. All right. You, you agree? Yeah. All the same thing. Absolutely. Um, when you look for wisdom, Creator God will grant you discernment. If someone, something, some activity, activity troubles, perplexes, or otherwise disagrees with you, ask for guidance and trust that you are being guided to avoid it, or at best, 
to approach it with uh, caution. Have gone into a room and as soon as you walk in, something there, don't agree. Don't, don't agree with you. And what's best, you better back out. Yeah. Or you better pray before you go in. <laughs> now think about this upcoming question and visualize a response, please, before we explore reasons why spirituality is vital on a daily basis in Gullah Geechee culture. What spiritual activities center you, propel you, or cause you to be contemplative or thoughtful? What spiritual activities center you, propel you, or cause you to be thoughtful about it? Now, for many Gullah Geechee people, gathering near or spending time watching a waterway is a spiritual activity. This activity and others have been used throughout history. And for what reasons? Well, the institutions of chattel slavery to which enslaved West Africans were introduced involved a process of dehumanization that entailed a devaluation of one's self-worth, a reinterpretation of family and community, a reconstruction of one's psyche to believe and accept that one's sole purpose was to serve his or her plantation owners and not their own families. So what things propel you, center you? What spiritual practices would you say center you? I Keep would thinking. Say for me, singing. Singing. Yeah. All right. Yes, Others? Keep yeah. thinking. Yeah. Now, going to church every Sunday. All right. It's, you know, it was a practice. You, you didn't do anything else that day if you didn't go to church. Right. So, that okay. was the number one. A spiritual thing. practice. Yes. Thank you much. Now, preach from pulpits upheld at slave auction blocks and by sales and separations of family members and reinforced with shotguns and bullwhips. This indoctrination um, was brutal and inhumane. An excerpt of another, of author Daniel Black's novel, The Coming reveals the harrowing experiences that the ancestors of Gullah Geechee people survived and passed down in their commemorative DNA of their descendants. Here's a scene from a slave prison. Daniel Black wrote, and I quote, we saw the slave ships before they saw us. Narrow cracks in stone walls allowed us to breathe and watch big vessels approach. Leaning neither to the right nor to the left, they glided along the water's so surface with remarkable balance and quiet ease. We were astonished that such big boats did not sink. Tall poles in the middle of them with large blocks of white cloth waving at the top, guiding them into what would become familiar waters. We would later learn that the names of, the names of these vessels, the Hope, the Lord Ligonier, the Mary, the Brooks, the Henry of London, the Hannibal of London, the good ship Jesus, the Henrietta Marie, the Charleston, and so many of others. They could not come ashore. They were too big. So our riverboats took us to them. On board ships, captain, captors did not love us. We knew this but they wanted us for something vile, something wrong, something that would diminish the supplier while exalting the supplied. Where we were going, we did not know. Where our gods had gone, we did not know. We called them over and over again, but the wind returned only silence. Some jumped overboard into the depths of the Great Mother, but with hands and feet bound, their struggling forms sank instantly into the dark water. Captors did not weep. They seemed instead to harbor anger that we did not want to go with them. Their words we could not understand. They picked through us like an assortment of fruit choosing whom they preferred. 
they scattered and melded tribes, unquote. Now, resistance sometimes was manifest in the singing of a song, in the holding on to a steadfast belief that deliverance would come, or that a trail toward it would be blazed, or in the praying to an unseen but felt God, or to ancestral spirits, sometimes a sacred dance, a rhythmic handbeat, or a meditative hum stills an individual spirit or serves as preparation to journey on. In the Gullah Geechee mindset, spirituality involves connecting with the source who can make one either hold his peace, reclaim her space, or fulfill the will and purpose toward which one's cloud of witnesses is guiding, encouraging, and cheering on. Well, back to that question one more. What thing centers you? What spiritual activities would center you? We've heard from two. Just one more. Prayer. Prayer. Thank you so much. Now here's how I saw spirituality unfold in my family, and as I express this in Gullah Geechee, you may read along, but don't worry, the English translation will follow. For that, they've been a deacon in the church, people been a love them up, they're gonna come ask them to have them with their problem death. When we never been a slappy wife and cold blood, I've been saying. A wife been a fine she way to the front door. The husband been a follow slow high you know. They both want to know how so far fix whatever be going wrong between them. Them other people, them other people that been a sense something inside daddy what tell them to find them and tell them what they for do. Mm -hmm. Daddy ain't been no perfect man now, but most of the time, when the people them come for telling me problem, him been no what for say for set them scream. <laughs> that cause of the spirit way in it. Him tell me neighbor for stop with the alcohol when he come home from what? I mean, mountain slap your wife and call him all the time. Everybody and everything got a spirit in them now. Wanna have a line but spirit it up. <laughs> Who did not understand? <laughs> oh, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful, <laughs> everyone and everything has a spirit within them, and you have to learn what spirit it is. Amen. So are you ready for the turd or the shirt or the <coughs> value of the day? Now you're the machine now. All right. All right. It is tenacity. Uh, are you aware of any Gullah Geechee individual, past or present, who models or who has modeled tenacity? Whose names come to mind? Tenacity, sticking to it, till the end, keeping going. Well, we're about to explore the life of a historic figure, but first, please join me in singing spirit music that's worthy of remembering. As I open my mouth unto the Lord, and the response lines again are in italics. I open my mouth unto the Lord, and I won't turn back. I will go, I shall go to see what the end is going to be. I open my mouth unto the Lord, and I won't turn back. I will go, I shall go, to see what the end's gonna be. Sometimes I'm up and sometimes I'm down, see what the end's gonna be. Sometimes I feel almost to the ground, see what the end's gonna be. I open my mouth unto the Lord, and I won't turn back. I will go, I shall go, to see what the end is gonna be. One of these mornings, bright and fair, see what the end is gonna be. I'm 
I'ma spread my wings and tear to the air. See what the end is gonna be. Well, I open my mouth unto the Lord and I won't turn back. I will go, I shall go to see what the end is gonna be. about a historic Gullah Geechee model of tenacity. Roiled by an inability to purchase the freedom of his wife and children out of slavery, and burdened by the inhumane chattel institution from which he purchased his own independence, Denmark Vesey was West Indies born, former property of a Charleston, South Carolina slave trader and planter a skilled carpenter, businessman, preacher, and independent thinker who exemplified persistence, determination, and perseverance. He exhorted those called slaves on nearby plantations throughout the region in 1822 to march to the freedom land, to the promised land of freedom, like the Israelites of the Bible. He fearlessly planned with conjurer Gullah Jack the Rising, which would not have been the largest slave revolt in U.S. history, to free about 9,000 enslaved Africans in South Carolina, which is a centerpiece of Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor. Though the insurrection was betrayed by a fearful few who plotted with him, who had plotted with him, and though he and others were sentenced and hanged, his spirit of courage and tenacity lives on. Dan Mark Vesey was tenacious, persistent, determined, persevering. A response is requested from at least two persons to complete the following questions. My most memorable, tenacious, immediate family member is, or, the greatest accomplishment made by an extended family member because of tenacity is important to me because who in your past has been tenacious? Jerome Holmes. He was determined to get Dunbar water, indoor plumbing, and the fire department and the bridge. All right, say that name out loud one time more. Jerome Holmes. All right, one more, one more. Who else? Your family from your community. Someone who has been tenacious. And you had those that worked alongside with Jerome Holmes in getting that yeah, and uh, you know he, the bridge across um coming across that we didn't have to go around 51. Mm -hmm. my father was a part of that yeah. the reverend late reverend thomas s lance yeah. Yeah. all right thank you so in closing please visualize a response to an important question gifted with tenacity that is persistence determination and perseverance what will you strive to accomplish in your home, community, or the world? While you're thinking of an answer, let's review the ancient wisdom of a Gullah proverb. Half cook rabbit, don't make no stew. Half cook rabbit, don't make no stew. What's that mean? Something my dad used to say. Pursue your dreams, work responsibilities and affairs with excellence and without procrastination. Utilizing only a fraction of your energies and abilities will accomplish only a fraction of your capability and realize only a fraction of your goal. Unless you fully cook a rabbit, you won't make a good supper. Half cook rabbit, don't make no soup. So, once again, the final question is, gifted with tenacity, Persi persistence, determination, and perseverance, what will you strive to accomplish in your home, 
in your community, in the world. I would say if you started something, don't stop. Sometimes you get knocked down or you get told no, but don't stop. Keep striving. Mm -hmm. Keep persevering. Whatever you do. Whatever you do. Anyone else? More specific. What do you want to accomplish? <laughs> what are you going to be persistent about? Got a Gigi people. <laughs> in Commons Bay Library in this kind of Gigi community. What you gonna strive for? Diversity. Diversity. All right. Yes. Respect for elders, spirituality, and tenacity. I thank you so much for allowing me to make this presentation about Gullah Geechee heritage to you today. Ooh. Ron, would you take a, a few questions? Yes, so, uh, little Q&A folks, do y'all have any any questions, comments for Mr. Dan? Yes. yes. Just to say that you talk us a proper noun, but you can change over and talk the Gigi talk. So you have to learn to do that. That's code switching. <laughs> and we all do that. <laughs> Even, even, even if you think you don't, you do. <laughs> now, um, if someone, if you get a phone call and you don't know who it is, do you use the same voice? Oh no. Do you use the same no. um, intonations no. as you would. No, I'm. Just... Would you say who this? Oh. <laughs> Hello. Who is this? Hello. <laughs> You're phone switching. <laughs> You're switching from speaking English to speaking Galagichi at a time, you know. Oh, God. Anyone else? You ain't tell me what, what your mama them been named. My mama them? Yeah. My mother's name uh, was Kathleen. Oh. Kathleen Days. Okay. Um, let me speak this story. Um, Throughout her life, she was called Zeke. Because Zekel, Ezekiel Grant, was her father. But her father um, died before she was born. Um, in fact, he died from tuberculosis, I think. So it was suspected that he was going to die. And um, he, it was thought that she would be a boy and to name her named the child Ezekiel, but she was a girl, and they called her Zeke all her life. Um, she got the name Kathleen because one of her older sisters did not want her um, to have this name Ezekiel. Um, and I think it was a, a book she had been reading on uh, how Kathleen saves her pennies, so her name is Kathleen. <laughs> oh, nice, nice. nice question. <laughs> and my father, my father's name was Chansom. Chansom Days. Um, he was the oldest um, surviving sibling. All the others uh, either died at childbirth or soon thereafter. So the midwife, seeing that he was healthy, said, We gon' Chansom, oh, or take a chance on his yeah, living. Right, so yeah. Chansom became his name. When he wow. became an adult, he took his father's name, Henry. <laughs> but Chansom. <laughs> Chansom and Zeke. Chansom and Henry. Chansom and Zeke were my parents. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes? Out of all the places and the uh, people that you spoke to, what's the most memorable, memorable moment for you? Of all the places and people that I've spoken to, mm, a memorable moment to me um, was during my second trip to Sierra Leone, West Africa, oh, wow. one of the white rice producing countries. In 2005, I uh, visited Sierra Leone and gone to Bunce Island. Bunce Island was a slave uh, castle. Um, from which most Africans 
Um, that's where they last saw the African soil. They were put in slave prisons and they were put on these ships and they never saw their, um, their, their home again. Mm -hmm. um, I had been to Ghana the year before and both times the music from my childhood, these little spirituals I grew up, would come to mind. And I, I wrote new songs to the tunes of those old spirituals. And one of those songs was Tears and Horror. Um, and that was about the experience of Bunce Island. And on my second trip, um, just in 2019, we got back just before the pandemic came on, and we were so glad. My whole family went, we were so glad. Can you imagine me <laughs> during the pandemic oh, in Sierra Leone? Yeah. Um, um, but I sang that song on Bunce Island, about Bunce Island, about the tears and horror experience there. That was memorable. Could you sing that song? I don't know if I remember the whole thing. <laughs> Tears and horror at Bonds Island. Tears and horror at Bonds Island. Africans on slave ships that saw their homeland when they left from Bonds Island. Africans were brought from far and near to the slave ship prison. They all feared Africans on slave ships last saw their homeland when they left from Bones Island. The ancestors for his prevail in the wounds of their voices. Where the mother's love to the slaves, we lost our homeland when we left from bones. Ancestry.com. I, I said earlier that um, in 2004 I visited Ghana, West Africa, as part of a Fulbright Hayes grant of about 13 educators from South Carolina and Georgia who went to Ghana for five weeks. As soon as that plane was landing, I saw all these people who looked like my father's people. Wow. There was um, so and so and so and so. There were all these people from St. Helens. I, I saw them and I was staring at them all the time. And interestingly enough, um, I was among four African Americans, the only African American male. Whenever we were out in the community, all the community members would wait until the others moved aside and they would come talk to me. 
They would be speaking in Fante. I don't speak Fante. I said, I don't understand you. I speak English. But I was told that because of my physical features, they thought that I was either Ghanaian or that I was African. They did not think I was African American. And that's one of the uh, similarities of Gullah Geechee people, our physical features. You will find your um, twin or close relative on the other side of the world. Um, and in Sierra Leone, the following year for this historic event that I participated in, um, when I stepped off the plane, it was the then Minister of Tourism and Culture came up to me and said, um, I saw you coming off that, um, stepping off that plane. You are um, fuller, he said. I am fuller. You are fuller. Every day for that seven-day um, trip, Fula, I said, you are Fula. So I thought maybe I was from the Fula tribe of people <laughs> of Sierra Leone. Um, but through DNA testing, AfricanAncestry.com, I found out that my paternal lineage is from Ghana, West Africa, um, from the Ewe and Han peoples of Ghana. And my um, maternal lineage is from the, not the Fula, but the Tenme people of Sierra Leone. Because throughout Sierra Leone, I saw people who looked like my family members and you traveled, you know, along these roadways. Um, and for uh, that, it's just a swab for your cheek and you send it in and they'll match you. There are different ones that have developed since then that they can show a number of different areas that you may, um, your, your ancestors may have come from. So that's one way of finding out. Mm -hmm. Uh, do um, you use any of the, like the culture that you, when you, after you found out your lineage, have you, you know, like use any of the culture like they're eating or, you know, whatever they, they, um, they did? Well, um, in both places, uh, particularly in Sierra Leone, uh, one thing during that, the trips there, there's a lot of rice. Um, <laughs> they eat a lot of rice dishes, mm -hmm. just as Gullah Geechee people. What rice, kind of meat? I mean, um, rice and uh, fish, uh, seafood, rice and vegetables or vegetables. Mm -hmm. um, oh, put them in a gumbo. Wow, yeah. Just, okay. just the way we do. Just yeah. the way we do. Yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That was wonderful. Just as, as expected from uh, Ron Days. And remember, next week we get another Days, Natalie Days. So the, the Days keep going forward. Uh, so we hope you all will come back and see us again here. And this will be up online at the Georgetown County Library YouTube page uh, soon. So you can watch it again. I think I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing all this again because that was uh, terrific. So let's let's give uh, Ron one more round of applause.